so-called TV game console TWT01 was made in 2021 for Sabor. In this episode I will highlight one of its accessories, the Sumato Sensory Gun 01, which is a gyro-based gun controller. The games which support this gun are discussed in detail, while the remaining contents of the console are just summarized. The name Sabor was chosen for international operation. In China, the company is called Xiaobawang, which can be translated as bully. Subo was best known for creating and selling Nintendo Family Computer clones, some of which can be considered as enhanced copies, as various models had higher specifications than a stock NES and therefore were able to run special software. In episode 220 I briefly talk about such systems. After its heyday, Subo licensed its brand to partners, who then created new products. This is also valid for the TWT-01. As such, it's not a big surprise that the same console and games can be found branded differently in various markets. In Europe and the United States, the Raw Pork variant is pretty common. It is noteworthy for reusing an AR gun shell. The Sumato Sensory Gun-01 has a matte smooth surface. The fine details were molded very precisely. Being a gyro gun, it's somewhat understandable that the gun lacks sights. The trigger operates a fairly tactile push button switch at low travel. The handle would have benefited of a thumb cutout, but its grooved front edge and the round smooth trigger guard make this controller decently comfortable to shoot either way. The same can't be said about the pump handle, which is used for reloading. It actuates a push button switch at the very end of travel and is pulled back in place by a squeaky metal spring. The long linear travel of the pump handle doesn't fit well with the strong tactile bump of the switch and the combination feels odd. On the front of the left hand side is an analog joystick. Pressing it in works as action button. Doing so causes the cursor to recenter and cuts off gyro tracking, which is used to re-establish the zero position. The gun is powered by two AAA cells. The battery flap is held by a metal temper screw and nut. This is very uncommon for a cheap toy and usually just can be witnessed at arcade grade guns. When the gun is low on power, the gyro tracking gets worse and the cursor will start to randomly point towards the top left corner of the screen, which of course messes with the zero position. The on off switch is on the left hand side, on top of an indicator LED, which was placed inside a punctured red dome. The Sumato Sensory Gun 01 has rumble-based force feedback, which sadly can't be turned off. It connects to the TV game console wirelessly. Besides the TWT-01, I have seen another Sabo console, which supports the Sumato Sensory Gun 01. Interestingly, it looks like a little PlayStation 5, which fits the clone console past of Sabo Rel. Two Wii Remote-style gaming controllers came with the gun. Each joypad is assigned to a particular player, who is indicated by a label on the face side. The units are very light, but rigid and sturdy. Seemingly, the same matte smooth plastic as with the pistol was used. The buttons rely on somewhat stiff rubber domes, but are surprisingly comfortable and were reliable in my tests. The four-directional PlayStation-style D-pad is accurate and passed my controller benchmark, which is the NES game Contra, very well. Its actuator is somewhat flexible, which allows players to press two opposing directions at once, but this demands quite some force and I can't imagine that it's beneficial to the D-pad's lifespan. The joypads are advertised as motion controllers and include a spring vibration switch. This switch consists of a resistor rod, which is surrounded by a loose metal spring, which can strike the rod if it picks up sufficient inertia. I have shown such a switch nude in episode 222. This kind of motion sensor just reacts to strong movements and is agnostic towards directions and orientation. I feel this is a missed opportunity, as the manufacturer has proven with the gun controller that they know how to handle a gyro sensor well. The joypad is powered by two AAA cells and connects to the console wirelessly. The TWT-01 is very small measuring just 9 by 9 cm at the base and 2.6 cm in height. The surface is matte, with the exception of the two polished indents and the two fake leather badge plates. The Chinese characters which spell out Xiaobawang are sharply embossed. 
The bottom is imprinted with model descriptions and power requirements. At the back is a HDMI video output and a trans flash labeled microSD socket. At the left edge is the power switch. The device is powered using its USB-A socket via a non-standard male-to-male USB-A cable. Such a cable indicates a host-to-host -host connection and can seriously harm equipment if used with items other than the TWT01. The console can be connected to a computer to function as a controller or receiver dongle. The PC sees the console as two separate input device instances which are labeled MoMA joystick. This allows for simultaneous two players gameplay. The spring vibration switch of the remote is also mapped to a joypad output. Curiously, start and select will hang frozen if both are pressed at the same time. The blockage is released when an action button is pressed. Sadly, the gyro information of the gun isn't translated to the PC. Furthermore, the gun's joystick readings are just outputted digitally. The pump handle, joystick click and trigger work as gamepad buttons. Depending on what kind of bundle is purchased, a dance mat is part of the delivery. Personally, I don't have this pad and hence I won't cover it here. After a cheerful splash screen, the user is shown the main menu. From top to bottom, there are dance games, running themed games, games which rely on motion detection, a NAS emulator, Android-like looking games, and the star of this episode, the Gyrogun games. Of the latter, a total of 22 is available, which I will now cover in detail. Upon selecting a gun game, a calibration screen shows up, which sets the sensitivity of the gyro sensor. In combination with the joystick click triggered zero position reset, this allows for pretty usable tracking. For each gun game, one of two difficulties can be chosen. Hovering the on-screen cursor over the top edge of the screen causes a circle to appear and slowly fill up. When full, the game is paused and the user is given the choice to enter the minigame selection or to resume the current game. None of the gun games offers continues and the player is brought back to the title screen of the minigame upon failing. Ragger of Wars is a three stages long on rail shooter in which aliens are fought. Each stage is concluded in a boss encounter. The player can freely toggle between three different weapons, a semi-automatic assault rifle, a light machine gun and a shotgun. In my mind this minigame is easily the high point of the world system apart from the NES emulator. On the title screen of Perfect Counter-Attack, artwork from Fallout New Vegas was pirated. The game moves from left to right through a futuristic looking landscape. Aliens have to be shot and humans who run across the screen have to be spared. Hitting humans yields in a health penalty. The same three weapons as in Wreck of Wars are available, but this time operating the pump handle for a prolonged time will cast a protective shield. This minigame also consists of three stages. In Hostage Crisis, the player shoots flying saucers before they succeed in abducting humans. In the bottom right corner is a counter that shows the number of remaining UFOs, which have to be eliminated before the minigame progresses to the next stage. The number of hostages is reset upon completing a level. The background toggles back and forth among two styles when progressing. Lightning Gunner is about shooting objects, which aliens throw at the player. A counter at the top right corner counts the number of shot objects and if it reaches the threshold, which is displayed in the left corner, the stage is completed. In the final two stages, there are two objects throwing enemies. Shooting the aliens is pointless because those are invincible. Two alternating backgrounds are used in five levels. Cave Ghost is a whack a mole type game in which aliens have to be shot and humans have to be spared. Hitting humans will consume the health bar at the bottom edge of the screen. In this minigame there is no need for reloading and I wasn't able to see any kind of progression requirement. All 10 levels toggle between two backgrounds. Sharpshooter is a target practice game. Similarly to Cave Ghost, this minigame apparently is solely played for high scores. Target plates are moved across one of two alternating shooting courts in 10 levels. Shooting Duck is a Duck Hunt copy. The bottom left shows a points threshold which has to be met before the top right counter runs out. The realistic looking ducks and the bright colors make this minigame visually pleasing 
but gameplay-wise it is one of the more boring titles of the system. Sniper Airborne might be the worst title on the whole system. It's about shooting aliens who fall down with a parachute. Shooting the aliens will cause them to juggle upwards. The aliens can then be shot again for extra points. There is no punishment for aliens standing or hitting the ground. The top right corner shows the to be met points threshold, but there is very little challenge as the counter counts up instead of down. Street Gunman reminds me of microcomputer era light gun games. The screen pans over a city themed background. Aliens appear in windows, doorways and on the street. It's a survival minigame, in which an unknown number of aliens has to be shot in order to progress. The game cycles between day and night when a level is completed. Frisbee Arena is a skeet shooting minigame, in which the player attempts to surpass a points threshold within a time limit. A semi-automatic weapon is used with infinite capacity. Besides frisbees, bombs show up from time to time. If those are shot, the player loses points. In Matching Memory, or Mix and Match as it is called on the title screen, a grid of coins displaying animals is shown at the beginning of each round. Each image occurs twice. When a round starts, the coins are flipped to a neutral back. The player then has to shoot the two paired images consecutively in order to have the coins disappear. In Toy Shooter, two conveyor belts, which run in opposing directions, are stacked. On the bottom of the screen is a list of toys. The player has to shoot toys on the conveyor belts in the order given by the list to progress. The projectiles travel quite slowly and have to be timed to the speed of the belt. The title screen of Intercept Mines has to be one of the worst Photoshop jobs I have seen in a long time. The minigame isn't bad at all though. In it the player has to shoot explosives, which traverse to the surface of the sea, where boats are floating. The goal is to neutralize those explosives, which are about to collide with a boat. If a boat is hit, the player's life bar is diminished. Each neutralization yields points and if a threshold is met, the level is concluded. From time to time pickups appear, which are activated when being shot. These may cause time to halt momentarily, clear the screen or replenish health. Digital memory is much like the game Simon Says, but with numbers instead of colors. At each start, numbers appear in sequence within a 16 tiles grid. The grid then goes back to neutral tiles and the user has to shoot those tiles where numbers were in ascending order. Dream Pieces is a Puyo Puyo like match 3 game. The chain length is just counted horizontally or vertically, but not around corners. The player can shoot the falling gemstones to make them change into a different kind. Eliminating stone seals points, and if a threshold is met, the player reaches the next level. Split Bomb is a bit like the arcade game Pang. The player has to shoot balls while protecting one or more humans on the playfield. If balls, which haven't yet reached their minimal size, are shot, they are split into two smaller balls. The smallest balls vanish upon being shot. This minigame is rather difficult and I enjoyed it quite a bit. In clear roadblock, a human runs towards the right hand side of the screen while explosives are randomly and aimlessly dropped. From time to time roadblocks appear. The goal is to shoot those blocks and hazards which are about to hit the human so that the person can make it all the way to the end. This minigame consists of four levels. Deer hunting or dozen deer, as it is called on the title screen, is similar to the game Big Buck Hunter. The big difference is that shooting does is not only permitted, but even gives more points than shooting male deer. A points threshold has to be met within the time limit using a two shots rifle. The minigame consists of four unique levels. Interestingly, a turkey sound effect was used as the death cry of the deer. In Sea of Fire, a set number of ships have to be sunken. The default weapon is a cannonball, which has to be timed to the trajectory of the boats, as it travels quite slowly. If the pump handle is engaged, the weapon changes into a sniper rifle, which can be used to intercept enemy cannonballs. Normal boats take one hit to sink, whereas armored ships take two. The goal in Annoying Bird is to have a farmer collecting a certain amount of fruit. Birds are attempting to steal fruit from the farmer, the floor and from the tree. If a bird succeeds getting away with fruit, the health bar is depleted. 
The farmer can't climb trees and has to pick up the fruits from the floor. From time to time bomb icons show up, which upon getting shot clear the screen from enemies. Fruit Shooter is similar to the game Fruit Ninja. Within a time limit fruits have to be shot for points while avoiding shooting bombs. On the bottom of the screen shot quotas for different kinds of fruits are displayed. Each quota has to be satisfied in order to complete a level. In Dump Shooter the player has to juggle trash items until they disintegrate by shooting them. If junk reaches the floor the life bar is reduced. A points threshold has to be met in order to complete a stage. I was pleasantly surprised about the fluid animations of the trash sprites, but overall I felt this game was boring. In this section I give a quick rundown of the non-gun related contents of the TV game console. There are two collections of simple motion controlled games. One consists of three different running games. The other set offers 22 games with various themes. Noteworthy is a boxing game which stole the sound effects from Namco's Tekken series. If I'm not mistaken, a score and statistics overview for the motion games can be assessed from the main menu. 58 Android style games can be played with the supplied joypad and are accessible in another collection from the main menu. I found some of those games very enjoyable. The menu item which shamelessly uses Mario and Luigi for illustration lets the player access one of Sabo's iconic multi-game cartridges. In particular it's the 501 collection which has been available physically too. Some of the included titles are genuine Famiclone games, some are hacks and others straight are pirated NAS ROMs. The emulation quality isn't bad and the included joypad does an adequate job. Long pressing select from within a NAS game allows the player to go back to the selection screen. The dance mat portion can be operated via the joypad too and is subdivided into two sections. One part consists of yoga and gymnastics exercises. The programs are fully voiced and interactive. The other part offers the actual dancing games and is further split into three. For obvious reasons I won't be able to play any of the in-game music, but for one instance I call it Gunnam style on my Roland TB03. Two programs share the same library of 171 tracks and just the background differs. The user can choose between two quite retro looking avatars dancing accurately in front of selectable backgrounds or much more sophisticated looking anime ladies which may or may not dance more generically. Within the dancing software the most exciting portion to me is a set of 40 full motion videos. Overall, the dance mat portion offers a delightful variety of Southeast Asian music. Besides a rich selection of K-pop, there's also lots of Mando pop. To me, it's a fun way to explore Chinese music, to which I otherwise don't have ample access. Personally, I was pleasantly surprised by the Somato Sensory Gun Zero One and the console which accompanied it. I didn't expect a gyro gun to perform as well as it did in this specific use case. In my mind it's a huge waste of potential that the gun's gyro sensor is ignored when it is connected to a PC. The Sumato Sensory Gun Zero One seemed to have a decent resistance against drifting and resetting the zero position was quite painless when playing on the console. The complete bundle with dance mat retails between 30 and 40 US dollars, which I think is a great deal for a child who is able to read simplified Mandarin Chinese. Although I was pleasantly surprised by the performance of the Somato Sensory Gun Zero One, I'm still very grateful that apart from a few exceptions such like the Jack Pacific Spider-Man Webmaster, similar devices on the western market rely on light based tracking instead. This is the end of the review, my name is Ben and thank you for viewing.